Welcome to lecture 7. In today's preparation lecture, we will define four postulates of quantum mechanics so that we have a formal framework to operate under when analyzing quantum mechanical problems. This lecture is broken up into four pieces, where each piece is related to each of the four postulates. These four postulates are, psi completely defines the state of a system, that classical observations have a linear operator associated with them, that solutions to the Schrodinger equation are eigenfunctions with eigenvalues, and that the order operators are applied can matter. The expectation value of a quantity and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be derived from this fact. We will also define what an operator is and what it means to use them. The first postulate we can define right away. It is stated as, the state of a quantum mechanical system is completely specified by the function psi of r and t, and it depends on the coordinates of a particle and on time. This function, called the wave function or state function, has the important property that psi star psi times dr is the probability that the particle lies in the volume element dr located at r and at time t. The postulate is written using all three spatial dimensions, hence r being written as a vector. However, this can be simplified into one coordinate as we have done up until this point. It is this postulate that defines the normalization condition that we have already employed, where the probability of finding the particle somewhere is certain. In this course, we will only be examining solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Time dependence only appears here to ensure a precise definition. Before we can define our second postulate, we must first define what is an operator. An operator is a symbol that tells you to do something to whatever follows that symbol. For instance, d by dx times x squared states, take the derivative of x squared. The d by dx is an operator. It says to take the derivative with respect to x of what follows. Operators are typically denoted with a capital letter with a hat on top. Using this notation, we can define d hat as the differential operator, and we can write d hat times x squared instead. In both cases, we get the same result. So let's do a couple of examples in order to get more comfortable with using operators. In this first example, what we have is we're going to use this operator A, which we define as being take the double derivative with respect to x, and we're going to apply that to this function 2x. So as a brief aside, since I'm going to take the double derivative, I'm going to apply that to 2x. Let's take the second derivative with respect to 2x. And if I take the first derivative with respect to x of 2x, then what I'm left with is just 2. And if I take the derivative again, then I'm going to be left with 0. So that means over here in this example, if I were to then take my a hat and apply it to my 2x, well, that's the same thing as me saying I'm going to take the second derivative with respect to x of 2x. which I can write explicitly in if I want to. But I know the answer to that is just going to be 0. That if I take the second derivative of 2x, then I'm just going to get 0. And it is this straightforward using operators, is that once an operator is defined, then you just simply say, I'm going to perform that operation to everything to the right of that operator. Let's now look at the second example. So the second example looks a little bit more complicated in terms of how a hat is defined, but it's still basically the exact same setup. So I have a hat and I'm applying it to x squared. And so if I substitute in for a hat, what I get is d squared by dx squared plus 2d by dx plus 3. And all that is going to be multiplied by x squared. And in this case, I just use the distributive principle where I take my x squared and I apply it to the right-hand side of all of these terms. So I have then d squared by dx squared times x squared plus 2 times d by dx of x squared plus 3x squared. And so now all I need to do is just evaluate each of these pieces. So I'm going to take the double derivative of x squared. Well, the first derivative is 2x the next derivative of is 2, so that just evaluates to being equal to 2. 
I add that to 2 times d by dx times x squared. Well, the, the single derivative of x squared is 2x. Multiply that by 2, and I get 4x. So this piece here just gives me 4x. And finally, there's no operation to do in this final part because I just have 3x squared. And so this ends up being my final answer when I apply a hat to x squared, where a hat is defined as d by dx squared plus 2d by dx plus 3. And that's equal to 2 plus 4x plus 3x squared. So let's do one final example. This example now is I have a function x times y cubed, and I'm applying some operator to it, a hat, which in this case is just the partial differential with respect to y. So in this case, I'm going to explicitly write in that partial differential, d by dy, xy cubed. And since I'm taking a partial with respect to y, x can be held constant, so I can move that out front. So what I'm left with is x times d by dy, y cubed. And so when I evaluate this differential, then I'm going to get 3xy squared. An operator is said to be linear if the distributive principle applies. And so in this first example, it basically shows that I have a hat, which is some operator, and I want to apply it either to the case where I have the two functions, f1 and f2, enclosed in brackets, and I can equivalently write that as a hat being applied to both of them individually. And so in this case, we can say that the integral operator is linear because it follows this distributive principle. I can take the integral of the two functions added together as a complete unit, or I can take the integral of both of the functions as individuals and summing them together. On the other hand, the square operator, defined as taking the square of a function, is not linear. The example written here where we apply the square operator to the sum of two functions demonstrates this. If squaring were linear, then I would simply square the two terms and add them. However, we know that the correct way to do this would be to multiply the terms according to FOIL, being first, outside, inside, and last. Therefore, the square operator is not a linear operator. This leads us to our second postulate. To every observable in classical mechanics, there corresponds a linear operator in quantum mechanics. We just covered what it means for an operator to be linear. The other part to this postulate, that every observable in classical mechanics has a corresponding quantum mechanical operator, is what allows us to measure quantities in quantum mechanical systems. Quantum mechanics wouldn't be very useful if we couldn't extract measurable quantities, because there would be no predictive power behind the theory. I've only listed three operators and their classical observables here. However, we will come across more as we move through the course. You are already familiar with the position, or x, observable. We are now simply defining it as an operator. Momentum in the x direction is defined as p hat of x, and its operation is to take the derivative with respect to x and multiply that by a negative ih bar. Finally, the total energy e of a system corresponds to an operator called the Hamiltonian. As we will soon see, when it operates on a wave function, it produces the Schrodinger equation, 